Let's see what the reformers said about the law. Well, we already saw Melanchthon said that Rome has transgressed God's commandments because it shifted the Sabbath to Sunday. But it's interesting to see how the reformers argued. Luther, in the front text, conflict between Melanchthon and Johann Agricola on the place of the law in the church had surfaced in the summer of 1528. Agricola joined the theological faculty in Wittenberg in 1536. He's the one who advocated antinomianism. We don't need the law. Soon after his arrival, anonymous documents circulated in the city arguing that the law belongs to the courthouse, not to the church. Luther challenged Agricola on the issue, and in, 19, oh, in 1537 sorry, they faced off in a series of six disputations that remain Luther's most important statements on the doctrine of the law. In the end, Luther and Melanchthon won the day and Agricola backed off. Now Luther had a way of saying things where people weren't quite sure. Was he now for the law or was he now against the law? And so some people were saying he was against the law. He wasn't for the law as we see it. And then he put it unequivocally because he couldn't stand it anymore and he wrote, I wonder exceedingly how it came to be imputed to me that I should reject the law of Ten Commandments. Can anyone think that sin exists where there is no law? Whosoever abrogates, that means gets rid of the law, must of necessity abrogate sin also. So there's Luther's position. The law stands. Martin Luther says he who destroys the doctrine of the law destroys at the same time political and social order. If you eject the law from the church, there will no longer be any sin recognized as such in the world. Martin Luther squarely in the camp of the law stands. Calvin, where do you stand? We must not imagine, said Calvin, that the coming of Christ has freed us from the authority of the law. For it is the eternal rule of a devout and holy life and must therefore be as unchangeable as the justice of God which it embraced. is consistent and uniform. Don't mess with the law of God, said Calvin. I like Dwight Moody. Now men may cavil as much as they like about other parts of the Bible, but I've never met an honest man that found fault with the Ten Commandments. That's quite nice. Infidels may mock the lawgiver and reject him who has delivered us from the curse of the law, but they can't help admitting that the Ten Commandments are right. They are for all nations and will certainly remain commandments of God through the centuries. The people must be made to understand that the Ten Commandments are still binding and that there is a penalty attached to their violation. Jesus never condemned the law and the prophets, but he did condemn those who did not obey them. And then he gives a couple of quotes. Dwight Moody, nicely on the side of the law. I like this man. I like him. Spurgeon always has, you know, extra flair. Spurgeon was an interesting theologian. He says, Jesus did not come to change the law, but he came to explain it. And that very fact shows that it remains for there is no need to explain that which is abrogated. Nice and logical. Thank you, Spurgeon. Assuredly, this was no abrogation of law. It was a wonderful exhibition of its far-reaching sovereignty and of its searching character. Once more, that the Master did not come to alter the law is clear, because after having embodied it in his life, he willingly gave himself up to bear its penalty. Though he had never broken it, bearing the penalty for us even as it was is written. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law and made a curse for us, and being made a curse for us. All we like sheep have gone astray, and then he gives all these wonderful verses. I am sure he carries on later. He would not because the law asked only what it ought to ask, namely perfect obedience and exalted of the transgressor only that which ought to exact, namely death, and exacted from the transgressor only that which it should, death. Interesting. 
as the penalty for sin. Death under divine wrath. Therefore the Savior went to the tree and there bore our sins and purged them once for all. I like Wesley. Wesley, in my opinion, was absolutely spot on. Wesley says that the moral law precedes not only Moses or Enoch, but creation itself. He says it is an eternal law. It comes from forever. Even humanity being first given to the angels and the expression of God's eternal pre-creation image and will. So, he says it's an eternal law. Wesley goes even further. And he says in this beautiful language of the New Testament, applies this directly to this moral law, calling it an incorruptible picture of the High and Holy One, the express image of His person. Wow, that's pretty close. And then he writes, and listen to this, this is beautiful. I cannot spare the law one moment, no more than I can spare Christ. Each is continually sending me to the other. The law to Christ and Christ to the law. The height and the depth of the law constrain me to fly to the love of God in Christ and the love of God in Christ endears the law to me above gold or precious stones. Isn't that nice? That's terrific. Example in the Bible. A woman is brought to Jesus caught in the very act of sin. Her accusers are with her, and they accuse, and they accuse, and they accuse. And he writes in the sand. Fascinating. God wrote with his finger when he wrote the Ten Commandments. God wrote with his finger when he condemned in the time of Daniel, the nation that was transgressing God's law. And God wrote with his finger when bigots, presuming to be better than the law, accused. He wrote with his finger. I wonder what they read. And why they disappeared one after the other. And when they finally were gone, Having had their hypocrisy exposed in the sand, he turned to the woman and he said, Where are your accusers? And they were gone. And then he said, Neither do I condemn you. What's that? He places her under grace. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He places her under grace. And then he says, Go and sin no more. He places her under law. Wesley, you got it spot on. Isn't that so? I cannot spare the law for one moment, no more than I can spare Christ. Each is continually sending me to the other. The law to Christ. Here I am a sinner. How am I going to be saved? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Christ sends her back to the law. The height and the depth of the law constrain me to fly to the love of God in Christ. The love of God in Christ endears the law to me above gold or precious stones. So Wesley's understanding of salvation went beyond Luther's focus on justification and he added the idea of regeneration, sanctification. I like that. 